Hello and welcome to News Click. I am Nilanjan Mukhopadhyay and you are watching the present, past and the future. In this program we talk about something very important which is happening in the present times. Uh, it obviously would have a past, we discuss the past at length and then we look at that the present and the past, what effect will it have on the future. In today's episode, we are specifically going to talk about the politics of appropriation. Now, when I was discussing this with a friend as to that this is the program which I am doing and it's going to be called the politics of appropriation, I was asked that what was I really trying to do? I said that look in very layman's term, it's basically a story of somebody else making someone else's history their own. Now, to, to simplify it, you know, as you have, you're watching and uh, probably uh, just a day or two before that, you would have seen on television these visuals of the Prime Minister Narendra Modi inaugurating the world's largest statue of Sadar Patel on the banks of Narmada. Uh, built as a huge uh, project of this government, a monument of unity of this country. About a week ago, uh, the Prime Minister was there at the Red Fort where he talked very highly about Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose and said, you know, this is the 75th anniversary of the formation of the provisional government, which was uh, announced by Netaji as part of the Indian National Army. Now, the f ironic fact is that none of this that we are talking about was actually part of the political process through which Mr. Narendra Modi has pol evolved uh, politically. I am talking about the Sangh Parivar. You know, if you look at Sadar Patel's politics or if you look at Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose's politics, you'll find that none of this had any resonance with the RSS or with the BJP at the time when it was happening. In fact, they were very strong antagonists to these important people. Now, to discuss uh, today's program with me, I have two very uh, eminent guests. I have S. Irfan Habib, a very noted historian. And I have uh, Satyanarayan Sahu, who has uh, you know, a person of multiple uh, talents, uh, who has also been the press secretary of President Kiyar Narayanan, served in the civil service at a very important period of time. Uh, Irfan Habib has, of course, done very commendable work on various aspects of modern history. You know, his work on Bhagat Singh is very well noted. His new book is also going to be out uh, in a short period from now. Now, the two of you, I wanted to begin by showing you a cartoon. You know, I'm sure that you would have seen this cartoon. Now, let me try to explain to the viewers as to what this cartoon is. It has a Dominic Ravan like figure of Mahatma Gandhi in the center with his 10 heads. Now, the 10 heads includes Jawaharlal Nehru, Sadar Patel, Maulana Azad, and Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose. And he is being slayed by two people. They are caricatures, but they resemble Shama Prashad Mukherjee and Vinayak Damodar Savarkar. There is a caption to it, Yato uh, Dharma Tato Sat, uh, Jaya, which means that wherever there is uh, dharma, there is uh, uh, justice, there is victory. Now, this is very highly ironical, you know, that you have a situation where on the one hand, this cartoon was there, it was published in a magazine called Agrani, whose editor at that point was Nathuram Godse. Now, a person who grew up from within the factory of the Sangh Parivar, you know, who edited a magazine like this, does a, publishes a cartoon here, and then few decades after that, these same people who are being slain here are being felled. Isn't this a Real paradox, uh, Irfan Habib. You see, I, I don't think it's a paradox. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sheer politics. It's a politics of convenience. It's a politics which, which, re, which, with which you can re benefit today. You're not bothered about past. And I say it again and again that they are not bothered about past. They are not bothered about religion. They are not bothered about history. They are only bothered about the present politics. That's all. 
they want to use everything from the past, whether religion or history, to their advantage, which actually gives them some mileage in their political right. march. That's all. So there is no sincerity in anything. So we should not see anything very serious in whatever they say, whether they whether they fate uh, both or they celebrate Patel, etc. There is right. nothing serious in it. They just want to sweep across people's emotions, sentiments, and just rough run rough shot over over the past. Nothing. Now, now you know. In this particular program, I also present certain thesis or what I call also a premise. Now, uh, the first premise which I have, you know, which actually takes off from what we are already talked about, is that the BJP is appropriating these national icons, you know, whether we are talking about Patel or whether we are talking about Netaji or we have talked about various other people. We will talk about others also who have done through the entire last four and a half years and even before that. It's because they have no icon of their own who can really match any of these nationalists. Sahu, coming to you, you know, when we talk about uh, Statue of Unity, when we talk about this entire uh, look at what they say in terms of the Rashtri Ekta Divas, that was the first, among the first things which was decided by the Modi government when it came to power in 2014. There is also a Rashtri Ekta pledge that you take where there is a certain way of reductionist approach, you know, that we take this pledge because it is Sadar Patel who has actually unified this country, just putting everything into the Sadar Patel uh, narrative and then saying that Sadar Patel is somebody who did so much for the unity of this country, yet he was neglected by the Congress, it was only Nehru's dynasty which has been promoted. And we are the real upholders and custodians of Sadar Patel. We are the ones who have resurrected Sadar Patel, his memory and his imagery in, in the country. You know, our question is, uh, there is no question of the resurrection. I mean, Sadar Patel's legacy is there. It was there. And Sadar Patel's contributions are well known. Right. You know, students study, researchers, they do research. It's already there. Question is, in a different manner, they are trying to project Sadar Patel, which is very, very objectionable, even though what you know, uh, Mr. Habib says, we should not take that seriously. I agree with him while agreeing with him, but I must also caution that the kind of projection, kind of uh, interpretation which they want to give to Sadar right. Patel's legacy, that should be challenged. Right. See, for instance, I have gone through his writings, Sadar Patel's writings, slightly familiar with his writings. He says, you know, in the context of, let's say, RSS, he says, it's one thing to serve the cause of Hindus and Hinduism, but another thing to use Hindus and Hinduism to hate others. Right. So that part of hatred which, you know, which was being carried forward by these uh, organizations was flagged by Sadar Patel and he cautioned them not to do it. And in so many words, he has written that RSS is a secret organization. Mm -hmm. He wrote in a letter to the RSS functionaries. And when that letter was received by RSS functionaries, they said, if RSS is functionary, then every Hindu, if RSS is secret, then every Hindu is a secret in this country. From what you are saying and you know, what Irfan Habib was saying previously, it brings us to the second premise of this, that the entire appropriation of pol the politics of appropriation which is being promoted by the BJP is actually built on very uh, flimsy grounds in terms of history. Now, uh, you know, we are talking about repeated appropriation. You know, we are talking about not just Sadar Patel, we are not only talking about uh, you know, Netaji, but even Gandhi, for instance, yeah. you, know, you know, don't you, you know, what do you really make out of the fact that they have tried to own Gandhi as if Gandhi is there, you know, their heart bleeds for Gandhi. In 2017, not just Gandhi, the entire national movement, recently Mohan Bhagwat gave a lecture where he talked very highly about the national movement. In 2017, Modi had a day-long session of parliament to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the Quit India movement. I want to understand that why do you think is this repeatedly they are falling back on icons? You know, we keep saying they do not have any of their own, but what are they trying to gain by leaning on Gandhi, uh, Patel, 
Netaji and various other people, even Jayaprakash Narayan, even uh, P.V. Narasimha Rao. I see it very, very clearly and people actually should see it very clearly because the, the point is they know what, what status Gandhi holds among the people, what is the position of Jawaharlal Nehru in the hearts right. of the people, what Nehru, what Bose stands for the people of India, what all these icons of our freedom struggle together stand for the people of India. Mm. Despite 70 years of freedom, we still go back to them, we still venerate them, we still remember them. We actually sometimes, and I say this in, I say this in the last book also, which I did on nationalism, mm. that we actually go back to Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose, and Modi actually talks about Subhash Chandra Bose from the Red Fort. But he will not talk about his... He yeah, hardly talked about his, uh, his, Netaji. His, his, he talked more about how Netaji has been neglected, yeah, by, the neglected by, by, by the Congress and by Nehru. The point is, this, this Nehru versus this binary which they try, try to create, this binary is a problem. And this binary is actually comes out of some sort of a complex which these people have. The complex is that they don't see themselves anywhere. Some kind of a complex, I think a very that is a serious phrase complex. which Irfan yes. Habib has used. Yes. Now, you have, uh, Sahu, you have done a lot of work on Ambedkar and you have particularly tracked as to how the entire memory and uh, the work of Ambedkar has been you know, appropriated by the Sangh Parivar, by the BJP, how they are trying to pose themselves as the real custodians of you know, Ambedkar's legacy. You know, I think what really prompts you know, no, no, no. Uh, the way in which they are trying to hmm. endear themselves towards Ambedkar. I would put it that okay. way. They are trying to endear themselves to Ambedkar and Ambedkar's legacy and to the Dalits of India by reducing Ambedkar to an icon who can be fitted into their event management strategy. Right. You know, the way they do it, you know, in a uh, absolutely... Um, you know, in a manner which would, uh, it's like a high decibel programs, music programs. Mm -hmm. The Constitution Day in two days in Parliament, you know, they were celebrated. And then Ambedkar, another program, you know, this, uh, you know, they, they try to, uh, they purchase that house in London right. and so on and so forth. It's all uh, event management programs. There is no serious reflection on Ambedkar's legacy. Mm -hmm. See, for instance, Ambedkar has clearly written, that Hindu Rashtra is a arrant nonsense. Mm -hmm. This is a, these are the words of Ambedkar. Right. Now, how, how does an Ambedkar fit into their entire program? Mm -hmm. And Ambedkar who said, I was a born Hindu, a born untouchable, I would never right. die a Hindu right. and never die a right. untouchable. He said Hinduism is a, based on graded social inequality. Right. And this is true. Even Gandhi also said the same thing. Much later, after 1920s, he started uh, very, very strongly indicting the caste system. Mm. And he said there is, uh, you know, caste uh, erosion, crime of caste and so on and so forth. All these things, uh, you know, they do, just do not fit into their entire worldview, right. the, the worldview which wants to appropriate it. So Ambedkar's legacy is conveniently or strategically been reduced to event management pro right. program. And so therefore we need to understand in that context only. You know, whenever we talk about reducing everything to an event management uh, program or appropriating a part of it, you know, they, we always have to talk about what I say is the, the third premise of this program. That is, the Sangh Parivar repeatedly has to appropriate others because their icons, the icons of the Sangh Parivar do not resonate nationally. You know, when we talk about, you know, the icons of Sangh Parivar, the first icon that we talk about, that whether they like it or not, the fact is that they have very uncomfortable icons also. Savarkar, for instance. Yes. Savarkar was never part of the RSS, though his book, Hindu, though, Who is a Hindu, you know, inspired Hedgevar to form the RSS. Yet he, he, he did not join the RSS. Yet, Mr. Modi, after becoming the Prime Minister, the first thing he did was he went to Parliament and you know very well the circumstances in which that entire portrait of Savarkar, yes. you know, you were very much there when President Narayanan was there, so you would have seen through it, you know. You saw the first attempt at appropriation when Mr. Vajpayee was Prime Minister. You know, that is some one chapter which we really need to recall, that how they tried to install Savarkar as a national icon but failed. 
No, no, first thing, Mr. during Mr. Narayanan's time, yes. when Mr. Narayanan proposed that Bismillah Khan should be conferred with right. Bharat Ratna, right. Bajpayee accepted the proposal of Mr. President Narayanan, hmm. but while accepting Bismillah Khan's proposal, they he also to suggested that Savarkar should also be conferred with Bharat Ratna right. along with Bismillah Khan. Right. So Mr. Narayanan set over that file right. for considerably long time and when on the occasion of his birthday, Prime Minister Bajpayee's birthday on December 25th, when he went to call, you know, see him and greet him, Mr. Bajpayee, he is, uh, you know, in a manner of a statesman, he said, Sir, I sent that proposal concerning Savarkar and uh, I have not heard anything from you and I feel you are not uh, happy about it, so I withdraw that proposal. Mm -hmm. So Mr. Bajpayee withdrew it. And as a result, so what happened? Mr. Narayanan, in a very, very diplomatic manner, he actually, you know, set over that particular proposal concerning Savarkar and therefore he could not get Savarkar, Bharat Ratna. Whereas when Mr. Kalam succeeded Mr. Narayanan, so it was Mr. Murli Manohar, Manohar Joshi, a speaker of Lok Sabha, right. he suggested, you know, Savarkar's name, it was approved by General Purposes Committee of Lok Sabha. And then Mr. Kalam went and uh, unveiled it, in spite of the fact that he was persuaded not to do so. Mm. And he, his, the, that persuasion was based on Sadar Patel's writings. Because Sadar Patel wrote that a fanatical wing of Hindu Mahasabha led by Binayak Damodar Savarkar mm. conspired to kill Gandhi. Right. And then the Kapoor Commission report. Yes. Which, which, was, which raises very important questions. Yeah, which, which was still, established by... Still remain unanswered. Yes. Yeah. You know, that were very severely indicted uh, Savarkar. You know, to borrow a phrase from the famous Thakkar Commission, which was appointed after Indira Gandhi's assassination, the needle of suspicion. Needle of suspicion, yeah. yes. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, much after, you know, recently, I think it, maybe a year back, somebody after so many years, decades of Mahatma Gandhi's assassination, somebody went to Supreme Court you know, asking him to delete all those indicting remarks on Savarkar right. and Marathis or something like that. Right. So, so the Supreme Court didn't agree with that. Right. You know, Irfan Habib, when we talk about politics of appropriation, when we talk about, you know, the way they are going to try to own up, own uh, Sadar Patel as their own, or whether it is Nehru or various other people. Let me pose, put it this way. There have been two clear definitions of what is nationalism in India. You have had the Sangh-driven definition, which is basically based on the tenet of cultural nationalism. And you have a parallel, more inclusive nationalism, which has been promoted and which was, you know, for which the entire freedom struggle was uh, fought. We can also call it a more, in, you know, inclusive or a more territorial kind of nationalism. Now, when they say that, you know, all the nice things about Sadar Patel or about Netaji Bose or various other uh, leaders of the freedom struggle, are they somehow or the other trying to uh, say that our definition of nationalism is wrong or are they trying to drag them into their uh, interpretation or their version of nationalism? What are they trying to do? Are they actually, you, you know, about, Mohan Bhagwat, you know, said that uh, the national movement was very important. So are they actually converting or actually, or are they, it's a, a reverse way around, are they trying to co-opt them into their uh, fold? Actually, they are trying to co-opt. So that's a different thing. Let us go back to, to the whole evol evolution of nationalism, right. uh, which, what we have today. When we were talking about nationalism, we were defining nationalism during the freedom struggle, because nationalism for us, the modern nationalism for us, is actually a product of, of our freedom struggle. Nothing like this happened, uh, existed before. While this exercise was going on, even during the process of this evolution of nationalism, there were, there were voices like the RSS, like the Muslim League, during the freedom struggle itself, who questioned this brand of nationalism which Congress was trying to espouse. Yes. Now, Congress was espousing nationalism which was debated, there was a churning which went through, and that churning took place between leaders, debated around, mm -hmm on several issues. Finally, it was agreed upon, which we call Nehruvian idea of India. Mm. Uh, but it was actually not just Nehruvian, it was an idea which was agreed upon by Sardar Patel, by Azad, by Gandhi, by so many others altogether over decades of 
debate and discussion. And that idea was to have a cosmopolitan vision, inclusive nationalism, composite nationalism, uh, inc uh, like uh, eclectic nationalism. You can give different names to it. And I've given that in my, in my book also, different names to this nationalism. Now, this brand of nationalism was an anathema to organizations like RSS. They kept questioning it. Akshay Mukul has beautifully brought this out in his book. So at the core of the disagreement with Nehru is actually uh, the, the idea of secularism. Exactly. That is the idea. Idea of togetherness. Idea of happily living together. That, that is an anathema to them. That is what they are trying to question today. They had been doing it all these years. But they couldn't do it from the center. Today they are going, they, they, are, they have been center staged. They have power. Now they can use all that which they believed all these years from the sides as something very, very central to the idea of India. You know, this is their India, which they have imagined all these years. It is actually all for all those who, who don't know RSS, may find it something very new. But this is not something new. This is what they had believed all these years. But they believed it only in their shakhas, in their little circle, you know, because nobody ex accepted them. Like P.N. Oak. P.N. Oak was not a historian to be respected. Right. Now today, it is his idea of... a great historian. Yeah. No, they cite him yeah. in TV debates yeah. with me many times. Right. Now, somebody whom, whom you actually laughed at, mocked at, is a respect, respectable historian. No, they mock you and then they put it yeah. into the tutorials of the university or WhatsApp and yeah. that is how it so, actually so, goes. So this is and then an untruth becomes the actual truth. So that is uh, the idea. You know, Sahu... Uh, you know, there are lots of ironies. Now, for the last four and a half years that we have seen this government, this is possibly one of the most centralized governments that we've ever seen at yeah. the central level. Uh, this government has also co-opted Jay Prakash Narayan in a very big way. You know, the entire anti-emergency struggle, you know, in fact, today the RSS and the BJP claim that they're the sole custodians of the anti-emergency struggle because the others who were there are actually frittered away. They're just not to be found. Maybe the couple of them like Lalu Yadav and here there. But others, you know, this is part of it, which is in the Janta Dal, you, uh, they are not, you know, to be found anywhere. Now, don't you find this extremely ironical that a person like Jayaprakash Narayan who fought against any kind of centralized politics, any kind of centralization is being considered as uh, a big icon by this government? No, absolutely. Because Mr. Jayaprakash Narayan, after all, he was a freedom fighter as well. Right. It's not just that he's, he played a big role in the post-independence India. Right. So the, he is a product of the freedom struggle, which celebrated inclusive nationalism, liberal nationalism, a nationalism which was coextensive with a planetary identity. Okay, so to co-opt him, you know, in other words, is to absolutely embrace something else, which is contrary to their own vision. So there is a desperate attempt to legitimize their you know, identity, the identity of the Sangha Parivar, whatever it is. So therefore, they are falling, they are trying to desperately locate somebody who would uh, affirm their place in, you know, the, uh, uh, the in India of 21st century. Mm -hmm. So that is the whole point. My point is even while Jay Prakash, I mean, I mean, part of the whole struggle against emergency, she finds the whole socialist, uh, whole lot of socialist leaders be it Madhu Dandavate, Mr. Rabire, Madhu Limai, and all right. that. So, you know, they, they have been completely, I mean, the, their legacy is nobody, nobody is talking about. So, this kind of appropriation which they are trying to do is... It's very selective. You know, it's not only selective, it's just because they are in power, they are doing it. Right. Once they are out of power, I think they will never remember them. Right. See, it is because, actually, I think it's a power-centric approach to appropriate somebody. Now, when he says that it's a power-centric approach to appropriate it, why, are they, to my final premise, is that this politics of appropriation is being pursued because there's realization that until and unless you own up these national icons, you cannot ever be popular. Now, we are talking about essentially about popularity. So, essentially, there is no belief, actually, but it's all a question of that, how do you become more popular? Yes. Sahu, if you remember that, uh, you know, when this government 
came into power, there were imaginations that this government is going to be, this prime minister is going to be a great reformer. But then suddenly after coming to power, they suddenly remembered that no, they must do something for the poor of this country. They resurrected the idea of Daridra Narayan, they resurrected uh, the idea of uh, Dindyal Upadhyay and his integral humanism, which till today is the official position, official philosophy of the BJP. But nobody really talks about philosophies in these days. It's all about showmanship. As you said, it is really doesn't fit into an event. So Dindyal became an event because it was his birth centenary. So it continued for three long years. One year prior, one year during the actual centenary, and then one year after that. So that's the way things are done. Now, don't you find it's a very contradictory thing that you are actually leaning on something, you know, which you really don't believe in? You know, you see, once, one, when one talks of Dindyal Upadhyay, one must be mindful of his opposition to the constitution. So when his name is invoked in the context of social justice or for any major oriented to reach out to the poor, I think that's a contradiction. In a, it actually contradicts because Mr. Dindal Upadha be, believed in exclusive nationalism, mm -hmm. a nationalism which is rooted in the identity of Hindus alone. Right. And therefore he stand very strong stand against the constitution. And then you juxtapose that strong stand against constitution with his pro-poor approach. It completely negates. Okay. So therefore, they are in a, a almost forcibly trying to bring in Dindayal Upadhyaya okay. and imposing on the people of India. Or in a way, they are trying to, you know, completely coercing others to accept his name. They are putting it in president's speeches and he has no option but to read out. So therefore, it's a kind of a very strange kind of a muscular approach to rewrite history. Ifan Habib, you know, we must always be uh, optimistic. Let's look at it, you know, a possible good that can happen. By constantly chanting the names of Patel, Netaji, Gandhi, various other iconic leaders, you know, even Jay Prakash Narayan or various other leaders of the country who have done very good for the, the people. Is there no chance that actually coming generations of people from the Sangh Pariyar will actually start believing that they were actually so bad as our uh, political ancestors, you know, really put no, them out to no, be? No, 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 because, because no, 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 at all. Because I, I have no illusions of that sort. Because, they, it, because these names are not being chanted in the way, in an honest way, the way they should be. Because when they talk about Bose, they don't talk about his his, his, his socialist ideas, you know, his, his actually hatred for, for fanaticism. He has written so much. Right. Talk about that also. What, what is the legacy, intellectual legacy he has left behind? What is the intellectual legacy Bhagat Singh has left, left behind? Mere, merely celebrating him as a martyr is not enough. You know, that is incomplete. It's true, but incomplete. Go back to what he left behind. The ideas, the vision of India. Both as well as Bhagat Singh, as well as Sadar Patel. Go back to 1949, what Sadar Patel spoke in Chennai, in Madras those times, about the RSS, about Don't the right Don't be selective way. in what you want to go back yeah, to. Yeah. I think that is the message which both of you are saying. I think we have covered quite a bit of ground in this discussion. Thank you very much for coming and uh, you know being part of this discussion. Uh, well, we were talking about the politics of appropriation and what we are seeing is that it is being appropriated because it is obviously good. Otherwise, why should anybody try to appropriate a history which was not theirs? On that note, that at least the history that happened in this country was actually the right history, but not accepting it previously was, was the wrong way of actually looking at it. Let's uh, look at it on a positive note that at least in the politics of the contemporary, the past is being, is being honored by the people who fought against it when it was when they were living at that time thank you very much for coming and watching this program